Hi, welcome to Atomic Structure Review Part 1. My name is Dr. English and today we're going to be looking at an overview of atomic structure. Specifically, we're going to be looking at the composition of the atom, a review of subatomic particles, Rutherford's gold foil experiment, atomic structure concepts review with a metallic element, and then atomic structure concept review with a non-metallic element. So let's start with the basics. Elements are composed of atoms. Three subatomic particles make up an atom. They are protons, neutrons, and electrons. Now the charge on a proton is positive. Positive charge. The charge on a neutron is neutral, so we're just going to put in a zero. And the charge on an electron is negative. Now there is reference table O in your reference tables that can help you a little bit if you forget the different types of subatomic particles and the overall charge. For example, the proton is listed right here and the charge on a proton is plus one. The neutron is listed right here, so N for neutron. And if you notice down here, there's a zero. So that basically means that it's neutral and then an electron has a negative charge. Now the particle that is associated with an electron is a beta particle and if you remember back from nuclear chemistry a beta particle is just a high speed electron and that's where we get our negative one right here. So protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons and neutrons are found in the nucleus. Nucleus that is where they are found. And the electrons are found outside the nucleus. When we look at relative sizes of these subatomic particles, you'll notice from this little diagram down here, protons and neutrons, while very, very small, are approximately equal in mass, while electrons are much, much smaller. So again, protons and neutrons, roughly the same mass. Electrons, much smaller. Now let's talk about the Rutherford gold foil experiment. So here's Ernest Rutherford right here. And basically what he took is he took a radioactive source in a lead box and he had a tiny little hole coming out of this box. And what he did was the alpha particles that came out of this box went straight forward and they hit this thin gold foil. When they hit the thin gold foil, they did a couple of things. Some of the alpha particles, which are pretty chunky particles, went directly through the gold foil and hit this space over on the side, lighting up this little screen. Some, though, didn't do exactly what Rutherford thought it was going to do, hit the thin gold foil, and actually deflect it off. Now, alpha particles are positively charged particles. When they hit the gold foil and actually were repelled by the gold foil, Rutherford drew a couple of conclusions based on his results of this particular experiment. The first one is that mass is located in a small dense nucleus. The second one was that the nucleus is positively charged and he figured out that by these deflections off the thin gold foil because the alpha particles are positively charged so if they were deflecting them that means there must have been something inside these atoms that was also positively charged. And then finally, the atom is mostly empty space because for the most part, these alpha particles were going straight through the gold foil and hitting the other side. So when you think about this, all Rutherford knew is that there was a nucleus in the center and that most of this space around the atom, if we were to put up like a in general spot right here, in general, a circle right here, most of this space over here was empty space. So the nucleus was going to be positively charged, the mass is located in a small dense nucleus, and the atom surrounding this nucleus is mostly empty space. So empty space surrounding this nucleus. And this is by no means to scale. Um, the nucleus is extremely small inside of an atom compared to the space surrounding it. So now what I'd like to do is just to review some general atomic structure concepts. So let's consider the element potassium. The symbol for potassium is K. The first question that we're going to ask is how many protons does potassium contain? Well, we can go down here, and this is an image that is taken off of your reference table. The atomic number for potassium is 19. And if you recall, atomic number always equals the number of protons. So how many protons? 19. What's the atomic mass? 
this number up here on your reference table is the mass number. So I'm going to round this to the nearest whole number for right now. We're going to say the atomic mass is 39. Now how many neutrons does this contain? Well remember, to figure out atomic mass, atomic mass is protons plus neutrons. So if I know that my atomic mass is 39 and my protons is 19, that means my neutrons must be 20 because 20 plus 19 will give me 39, which is the atomic mass. As an atom, and this is the key word to pay attention to here, as an atom, potassium contains how many electrons? Well, remember, if something is listed as an atom, that means the number of protons will equal the number of electrons. So as an atom, potassium will have 19 electrons. What is the symbol for the potassium ion? Well, potassium is K as an atom, and then it has one oxidation state associated with that. And potassium can be plus one. As an ion, how many electrons does it have? Well, remember, in an ion, protons do not equal electrons. But you can't change the number of protons. If you change the number of protons, you change the element. So if I know that my protons are 19, and this is a plus one charge, and I can't touch them, that means the number of electrons that I'm going to have is 18 electrons. Why does it have a positive charge as an ion? Because we're going to have more, more protons, that's an R, more protons than electrons. More protons than electrons. Because if I have 19 protons and 18 electrons, if I subtract the two, I get one. And I have more protons, and those are positive, so the overall charge is K plus one. What is the ground state electron configuration? Well, again, we go to our periodic table, and we look at the ground state electron configuration, and it is listed as 2, 8, 8, 1. How many filled shells does it have? Well, if we look at this, we're going to see with this 2, 8, 8, 1, to figure this out, we're going to use the formula 2n squared. So in the first shell, I could have a maximum, so for the first shell, 1 squared is 2 times 2, so in the first shell I can have 2 electrons max. In the second shell, so that's going to put a 2 in for the second shell, that's 2 squared is 4 times 2, that's 8. In the third shell, I'm going to have 2, 3, 2. 3 squared is 9 times 2 is 18. And then finally, in the fourth shell, I'm going to do 2, 4 squared, which is 16 times 2 is 32. So I'm going to take these numbers here, the 2, the 8, the 18, and the 32, and I'm going to compare them to my original electron configuration that I have for potassium. So I can see that the first shell is filled and the second shell is filled, but the third and fourth shell are not at maximum capacity. So how many filled shells does it have? Two. How many partially filled shells does it have? Two. And finally, how many valence electrons does it have? To find the valence electrons, we always look at the last number of the electron configuration. So in this case, potassium has one valence electron. One valence electron. Okay, now let's talk about a nonmetal. Consider the element chlorine. Now the symbol for chlorine, and again, we have this visual coming from your periodic table, we can see that the symbol is Cl. How many protons does it contain? Well, down here we see that the atomic number is 17. So that means we're going to have 17 protons. What is the atomic mass? Now on here it's a little blurry, but it's 35.4. So again, I'm just going to round this to the nearest whole number for the sake of convenience and call this atomic mass 35. How many neutrons does it have? Well, again, remember, protons plus neutrons will give me my mass number. So if the number of protons is 17 and my mass number is 35, basically what I'm going to do is solve for x, and this will be 18. As an atom, 
Chlorine contains how many electrons? Well again, remember, if it's an atom, the number of protons will equal the number of electrons. So that means in a chlorine atom, I'm going to have 17 electrons. The symbol for the chlorine ion. Well, again, we know that Cl represents chlorine. Now, if you look down here, we have charges negative one, plus one, plus five, and plus seven as selected oxidation states for chlorine. That's not all inclusive, that's just selected oxidation states. But because ultimately we're going to see that the electron configuration is 287, chlorine as a nonmetal is more apt to gain electrons than lose them. So the most common charge that is associated with chlorine is going to be minus one because it's much easier for chlorine to gain one more electron and get a full octet in its outermost shell than to lose one or five or seven. These will be used later on, but for right now, we're going to say that the most common charge that we associate with chlorine is minus one. As an ion, how many electrons does it have? Well, again, remember, protons do not equal electrons do not equal electrons when we're talking about ions, and you can't change the number of protons. So we have 17 positive protons. That means we're going to have 18 electrons. So why does it have a negative charge as an ion? Because we're going to have more electrons than protons. Protons can't change. So the difference between 17 and 18 is one. I have one more electron than proton, so the overall charge is minus one. What is the ground state electron configuration of chlorine? So we're gonna consider it an atom and say that based off of our information on our periodic table, it is going to be two, eight, seven. How many filled shells does it have? Well, if you remember from the previous slide, we said in the first shell, you can have a maximum of two electrons. In the second shell, we can have a maximum of eight electrons. In the third shell, you can have a maximum of 18 electrons. And since we only have three shells right here, we're going to stop right there. So we can see based off of here that the first shell and the second shell is filled, but not the third shell. So how many filled shells does it have? Two. How many partially filled shells does it have? One, because this third shell only goes to seven electrons when it theoretically that could go up to 18 when completely filled. So how many valence electrons does it have? Again, we look at the last number in the electron configuration, which is seven. So this has seven valence electrons. So what did you learn in this brief review of atomic structure? We went over the composition of the atom. We did a little review of subatomic particles. We talked briefly about the gold foil experiment. We looked at atomic structure concepts review with a metal. And then finally, we talked about atomic structure concept review with a nonmetal. Need more help? Feel free to contact me. Have a great day.